Everybody, from the learned historian to the school child, can name the men who were the leaders of the American Revolution and help create the documents that are the basis of our government. These forefathers, as we call them, include such greats as Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, George Washington, and John Adams. But what many people don't know is that our forefathers had a forefather, a man whose political theories and writings inspired and guided the American revolutionaries from concept to constitution. His name was John Locke. Even the very wording of our Declaration of Independence was in part taken from the writings of Locke. The famous phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, was originally written by Jefferson to read, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. But Franklin scratched out sacred and undeniable and scrawled over it the words of John Locke. Even though he died over 70 years before Paul Revere's ride, John Locke played as critical a role in the American Revolution as any of our forefathers, and he played an equally strong role in the French Revolution, which followed 13 years later. Today, his writings still endure as some of the most influential and provocative in the history of philosophy. The man who gave the impetus to both the French and American revolutionaries was himself an Englishman. According to John Locke, he was born in a storm. This wasn't a reference to the weather that day of August 29, 1632, when he came into the world, but to the political turbulence rocking his homeland of England. The 17th century in England was a period in which the role of the monarchy and the character and relationship between ruler and subject were topics of constant debate, conflict, and doubt. It was an age of transition, one in which the Western world's view of government, politics, and human rights would be completely transformed. In the 1600s, Protestants and Catholics were locked in power struggles and conflicts throughout Europe, and England was no exception. The period of John Locke's childhood was the time of a ten-year civil war between England's king, Charles I, and the Puritans. Locke's father, a lawyer, fought on the Puritan side as a captain in an army raised by a landowner named Alexander Popham. It was a good side to be on. Not only did the Puritans win, but when they did, Popham, now a friend of the Locke's, was in a position of influence. He used that influence to help get Captain Locke's son, John, into the prestigious Westminster School, where he could ground himself in the classics and prepare for college. At Westminster, most of the teachers were still loyal to the king, and they passed those royalist sentiments on to their students. Locke, raised in a Calvinist family and son of a captain in the Puritan army, was suddenly surrounded by people of the other side. When Charles I was executed in nearby Whitehall, the entire school, faculty, and student body alike was filled with indignation. Locke, too, felt sympathy, even though his own father had fought against the king. After Westminster, Locke left to enroll at Oxford, where he was now in the opposite setting. The faculty was ruled by Puritans. All this early exposure to both royalists and Puritans gave Locke an understanding and respect for elements of each side, but it also gave him a lifelong distaste for extremism of any kind, whether political or religious. His exposure to this extremism was laying the groundwork for his future writings on religious tolerance. Locke didn't like Oxford very much. He found the curriculum rhetoric, grammar, moral philosophy, geometry, and Greek to be uninspired. To make up for it, he spent his free time pursuing his own interests, experimental science and medicine. About this time, Locke inherited a small portion of his father's estate, which came with a modest yearly income that gave him a little more independence. After graduation, Locke was offered a post teaching Greek and philosophy at Oxford in Christ Church, the most important college in the university, and one that was more politically mixed than the rest of the campus. He accepted the position, even though he had no intention of making a career out of teaching. One of Locke's colleagues at Christ Church was a man named Edward Bagshaw, who published a pamphlet advocating religious tolerance, political liberty, and natural rights, ideas he felt free to express now that the king had been overthrown, and ideas which would later make Locke famous.
But at this time, still in his early 20s, Locke attacked Bagshaw's ideas and even maintained that a government had the right to enforce religious conformity. Unfortunately for Bagshaw, the monarchy of England was reinstated with the restoration of Charles II, and he was expelled from the university, thrown into Newgate Prison, and died shortly after his release. By the time his friend Bagshaw had been destroyed for his political beliefs, Locke had undergone a transformation. This happened partly because he met and made friends with a man named Anthony Ashley Cooper, later known as the Earl of Shaftesbury. Shaftesbury was the leading liberal politician of his time and an outspoken champion of religious freedom. He had spoken out in Parliament against every bill that came along which threatened the rights of those who didn't conform with the ruling government. Shaftesbury wasn't exactly what one would expect in a mentor or role model. He was described as small, ugly, very vain, and untrustworthy. There were also stories that he kept brothels as a sideline. He was a forceful, aggressive politician who had made many enemies, some of them in very respectable circles, such as the poet laureate of England, John Dryden. But in spite of these failings, he was an intellectual with a deep interest in science and philosophy, and he spent his entire career trying to expand the liberties of English citizens. He stood firmly for all the same issues that Locke supported. A constitutional monarchy, Protestant succession to the throne, civil liberty, religious tolerance, the rule of Parliament, and the economic expansion of Britain. It was inevitable the two would hit it off from the start. Locke and Shaftesbury became such good friends that Locke moved into Shaftesbury's elegant house in London, where he served as his private physician. Locke had become a physician almost by default. At Christ's Church, he had been required to teach the philosophy of Aristotle, which he considered a waste of time. His passion for natural science was growing deeper, but he hadn't been allowed to use the laboratory, except on rare occasions. Finally, he'd taken up medicine, partly because it was the one field in which the Church wouldn't require him to take holy orders. Even though Locke was never able to obtain his doctorate in medicine, he did receive a license, and Shaftesbury took him on as his private doctor. Soon he was glad he did. Locke saved his life when he had a silver tube inserted to drain a cyst in Shaftesbury's liver. Shaftesbury wore that tube for the rest of his life, but being the dandy he was, he soon had the silver one replaced with a gold one. This operation convinced Shaftesbury that Locke was a genius who needed only to find his calling. He urged him to read philosophy, including René Descartes, introduced him to eminent thinkers and philosophers, and inspired him to read economic and political theory. These explorations into human thought inspired Locke to write the first draft of his masterpiece, Essay Concerning Human Understanding, which he composed while staying at Shaftesbury's house. That was just the first draft, however. The final draft would take 20 more years. Locke lived with Shaftesbury on and off until Shaftesbury died in 1683 when Locke was 51 years old. During those 15 years, he served not just as Shaftesbury's physician, but as his advisor on general affairs. He also held minor political posts and became embroiled in the fiery politics of his time. Shaftesbury entrusted Locke with a variety of tasks, negotiating his son's marriage to the daughter of an earl, serving as secretary of the group that had been formed to increase trade with America, and helping to write a constitution for the new American colony of Carolina, one which gave freedom of worship to all colonists and denied admission only to atheists. While all this was going on, Locke also became a fellow of the Royal Society, the leading scientific organization of England. Meanwhile, Shaftesbury had risen to the ranks of Lord High Chancellor of England. He established the Council of Trade and Plantations and made Locke its secretary. Steadily, they were gaining more power and influence together. Locke was a handsome man, mysterious and even romantic, who took elaborate care to guard his anonymity as a political writer. He invented all kinds of secret codes, adopted a form of shorthand that only he could read, and sometimes even used invisible ink. He was, in his own way, a man of deep faith. 
He believed there was divine order to the universe, and he also believed in the prospect of life after death. But he did not believe in miracles and